Well, what I would say is, like my daughter says, I was always an artist. I come from a family of artists. Um, goes back many, many generations. So I didn't. I, I've always done art. My mom was not. Um, she wasn't pushing it. She was um, just making sure you know we got fed and <laughs> grew up and went to school. So when it started to come out, it was evident as I did art, she didn't really necessarily encourage it. So it wasn't until later that I started to recognize that I had a very big pull to do art. So when I was in high school, I bought my first camera, bought a Nikon. It was very expensive. Um, my mom wasn't thrilled that I spent money on it. It cost a lot of money, but I was just smitten. I had massive organization skills with, all, this is back in the days of having negatives. So I, everything was tedious, you know, like, and you didn't want to waste film, but I would take a whole roll just on a cat jumping around in the yard or something. Loved it. Um, then, let's see, I don't know, in high school, I did great when I started taking art. I was fairly natural at it, but I wasn't, I wasn't finding my thing. I enjoyed some clay courses. I took clay. Um, in high school that was great but again it wasn't like I wasn't finding my niche it wasn't until my mom took a course from a local lady for stained glass and then I was home from college I was just there doing what was it? I was there for art I was at college for art again I just I did well at much art but I didn't know what I wanted to do so I was just taking classes because my idea was take classes at college until I could drive a tractor trailer, which I thought would make enough money for me to figure out my life <laughs> while I had some time alone. So that was the plan and it did work really well. Uh, the, then I went home for my um, freshman year, right around Christmas time, had to get a Christmas present for someone and my family would typically make gifts. So I didn't, I was telling my mom I didn't know what I was gonna do for the people I was living with and um, Richmond, it was a family. I wanted to do something nice for them. And she was like, oh, you can make them a stained glass. And I was like, oh. So she showed me, she gave me a five minute tutorial on leaded stained glass with the copper foil method. And I, I loved it. I loved the color, I loved the shapes. My mom worked with scrap glass. She wasn't cutting her own glass. So it was just a matter of playing with broken pieces and fitting them and it was like a puzzle. I love puzzles. So I. My mom gave me a brass ring and I fitted in it glass um, based on a very simple sketch of just rays, like sun rays coming out from a point. So it was just like a perspective piece and it was so much fun. Uh, it was tedious though, you know, foiling every piece. But within three days I had a gift made for the people I lived with and I was totally in love. It was maybe, I don't know, a year or two later I found a notebook that I used to doodle on when I was in high school. And it was just the cover, those covers from the college rule notebook type things. And I had doodled all over it in the shapes of the stained glass that I worked with. So when I saw that and it looked just like the stained glass, I, I just was shocked. So I felt that there was like a, a natural, almost genetic memory for uh, shape, for things that drew me. And I just knew I was, it was like an, a, a confirmation. I was on the path I was supposed to be on. And so I continued with the glass work. And it wasn't, I didn't think I could draw. I didn't think I could paint. It just felt like that would be too scary to do. And yet I was drawing my sketches for my mosaic work and they were great, but I, I never owned it that I could draw. <laughs> it wasn't until probably 12 years of doing mosaic work that I just suddenly um, had this memory that I could paint. And that's when I started to paint with oils. Glass. Significantly after. Okay. I doodled in painting. There was three paintings I did when I was young. My mom bought me some acrylics for Christmas and some canvases, some different three, you know, they were just like sandwiched together in the package three canvases. It wasn't until after, like I did those three canvases and I, I used a book and I painted and then I ran out of canvas because my mom never bought me anymore. So the paints just went to pot and the canvases, I held on to them for a long time. 
And then in a process of decluttering my house, I got rid of them. Um, and a friend wanted them, so I gave them to her. So she took them and she's like, oh, these are good. You can't throw them away. And I was like, ah, I don't have room. So it wasn't until years after I started painting that I was at her house and saw, like when I walked in the door, I saw these paintings on the wall and they drew me because now I'm painting. So I have this relationship with painting and I was like, oh, those are pretty interesting. And I went up to them and I'm looking at them. And then I literally, I about died. I thought, oh my gosh, these were, these were mine. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that they were that good. Um, and I couldn't believe in that moment that my mom did not get me more canvases. <laughs> I was like, holy cow, who is a kid doing this kind of like artwork at 13 and they don't like recognize it? I don't know. So my mom was not paying attention, I guess. So I was just blown away. And then I wanted my pictures back, you know, like because I wanted to be able to show then and now, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, it was pretty wild. So. Yeah, I just, I, I, it was a gradual process of coming back. To, I mean, obviously, I, did, I wasn't comfortable. I didn't even know I had skill when I was a kid. If I had been stronger in my sense of self as a child, I would have owned my abilities much sooner, I think. Yeah. Well, it was the only thing that interested me. So I knew at 16, I was planning to go into truck driving because I felt like that was a really good place to just work on me, save money, live below my means. I had no clue how much money it took to live, but I had a feeling that um, going into debt with four years of college was not going to cut it. Yeah. So, <laughs> and in high school, I, I took this test or something. I don't know what it was, but they run you through this little thing. It's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a photographer because I was doing photography and I loved it. And it said, well, this is what you're going to need. You're going to need four years of college, then two years of some specialty extra on top of it. And you can expect to top out and make, no, I, like maybe it was like you could expect to make 22,000 maybe your first year and top out at 26. I, I was just like, well, I am not doing photography then. Like that doesn't make any sense. It, it did not make any sense. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to figure something else out. Photography will have to be my, you know, my hobby. So um, when I stumbled onto truck driving, I don't, I don't even, I didn't even know anyone who drove trucks. So when I stumbled on that, I was like, hmm, this makes sense because then I can live on a truck, save my money. And if in a year trucking doesn't work out, I'll have money saved to go back to school. Hmm. So the two years I went to college prior to trucking drained my account. They, yeah, it, it may drain my, my savings. And I don't know, I, I didn't know how to go work two or three jobs to save money to pay a school year. I hadn't figured that one out. <laughs> Babysitting uh, didn't make that much money. So it worked out, it worked out really well. I actually didn't retire trucking until the artwork was rolling into the tractor so I was doing commission work for mosaics in the cab of my truck on the bed. And I was like, I knew this was not the smartest thing, you know, working with glass where I sleep. <laughs> Feng shui wise or whatever, it just was not a good mix. So I did that two winters in a row where uh, people's commission work overlapped into the season I would do trucking. And then I was like, I gotta make a choice. So that was when I choose to retire truck driving and just focus on the art. Well, the advice that I, I do give people, it's more often than not that parents, because the parents are looking for the answers for their kids, like, what do I do? Where do I send them? And I always just tell them, if your kid loves art and he works on it every day, he will find himself in his art. It's, I think, when we get forced to do things or, you know, boxed in that it's hard, it's hard to, to be in our truth with it. And art isn't direct access to our personal truth. So how are we doing it? It's like, how are we being loose with it? Are we being imaginative? Are we, are we applying creativity to it? That's the kind of thing I would, I would just recommend playing and doing the art. So basically just a matter of, you know, practice and experiment. 
yes. effectively. Yeah, and I don't know if practice, explore. Yeah. I would say explore before practice. You know, I'm working with a nine-year-old right now. I teach art too, and this nine-year-old, he stumbled on, we were, we we're always looking at different things, and we had been, you know, doing different mediums, trying different things out, and we stumble on gravity art or gravity painting, flow painting, and the kid falls in love. So we're like for the last seven months, every lesson he has to pour paint. <laughs> this is his passion. He loves it, and it's fun because to see someone who's like. All right, so we are going to pour paint today. You know, and I didn't, the last class we did, he didn't get to pour paint because I want him to take it to another level. So I had him spend his hour class building um, up a canvas with clay. So then he'll pour next, next class. And he was okay with that. Typically he won't, he, he just, actually I don't even think he's nine, he's eight years old. Typically he's just not okay if he's not pouring that paint. He likes to see the cells build and the colors merge and form and to see him light up, to see him like explore, that's, that's inspiring. You know, that's what I want in my own art. I don't want to be doing it and then judging myself and then walking away and feeling yucky about the, the project or the experience. So it's like, how do you stay present in the fact that it's just an exploration? And then as you stay present, as I stay present and I see that I'm exploring, this piece, I start to feel the, the parts of me, you know, that are coming up in it. I almost don't know, like the, it's like the bird or the chicken or the egg, <laughs> because I've been drawn to the, um, the French Impressionists, but I didn't study them. And so I'm, I'm, my, my mom's family is French, and um, it's very possible that with all the generations that my love for the French Impressionist comes out of a direct genetic predisposition to be more Impressionistic. So when I started painting, I didn't copy anyone per se, but I loved, I, I just naturally did Impressionistic work, and I love it. The drive I have as far as being an artist is my passion to create. So uh, a new medium is exciting. Uh, I create in food also. I create, I always create new dishes and never use a recipe uh, that would pin me down. So I just, I love the process of creation. In creating, I feel new and alive and aligned and excited and it seems to create a momentum of more and more and more and then when I have to come back down and do the same old whatever that might be <laughs> you know like do mommy <laughs> when I do that it sometimes pulls me out of it and then the momentum is broken but I, it's just that the creating just what's next So new ideas for non-commissioned work come up in the quiet. So in the quiet, I'll be thinking of something that I'm working on or I'll just be dreaming of what's possible, like the possibilities, like, ooh, I really want to play with watercolor and what's possible. And I'll be thinking up a new class for um, the kids I teach. And, or I'll be stumbling around on YouTube and something will catch my eye. It's in that and then just sitting with it in the quiet though. It's always in the quiet. It's like at sunrise, watching the sunrise or laying in bed in the morning or drifting off at night. Something will just pop up like an idea. Like, oh, try this. You know, like, let's try this. And I'll see it play out. You know, I'll see the idea play out and then I'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm so doing that. <laughs> Mm, I would say yes to that. I love to teach. Um, I believe that everything that I know can and should be available to everybody. So when I teach, I don't hold back. I felt like in college there were teachers who held back. They held secrets like 
ooh, I'm not gonna tell you about contrast or I'm not gonna tell you about how to make this like work. But the few people that have had so much, there's this one artist who had massive impact and I think I spent five minutes with the guy. I mean, a little longer, but as far as talking, maybe five minutes, but it was really powerful, like those five minutes because he shared at the level that it mattered. Like, how amazing is that? You know, to, to just share the piece that is like, I won't say critical, but that matters, that piece that makes all the difference. You know, who cares about all the rest? You know, blah, blah, blah. But if you can do that one piece that really matters. So, you know, his piece that he shared with me, it, it's almost like these little pieces are your truth, you know, and they're so powerful and so special that they just zing right through you. They align you in a moment and you know that thing. It's like you remembered it. You remembered it and you own it. So that's my thing. It's like I just want to share truth with people and truth in art and when um, and if they're ready or if it's res you know resonates with their own truth then it's really magical. Like there's just not a lot of people giving away truth. <laughs> Yeah. I will do my best. So intuition is the ability to tune within, to connect up with information, truth, uh, your higher self, um, but to connect up with knowledge and information. So being an intuitive artist, I don't go to a book, I don't go to a teacher, I don't go to a class to learn it. I just tune in, tune within to, to know. Ah, oh, that's good. I just tune within to know. So when I uh, started to paint, there was this moment, there was a, a family moment. My family gets along. Like I have five, brother, five brothers and a sister and my parents and always pretty gentle with one another. And, um, you know, care about with, you know, care about each other. So there was this moment that happened that involved my sister and my dad. And it got me really angry. And a friend of mine said to me, uh, well, do some art therapy about it. And I was like, I can't do art therapy. And at the time, I was a glass artist who didn't believe I could draw or paint or whatever. And so she says do art therapy and I'm like well I'll, I'll just control it and it, it's not going to do me any good I'm most often a happy person and so this anger went on for five days six days and it was just like a week I was like that's it I'm over this so I dove into like so I, I grabbed a notebook and I grabbed some um some oil pastels like crayons I was truck driving at the time. I brought everything onto the truck with me and I thought, oh, I am so doing this art therapy because I was so angry and it wasn't like me. And every time I calmed down, the anger rushed up again and that was not fun. So I took this notebook and I started to just write a word on the bottom and anger was my first word. I didn't know how to do art therapy. I was just winging it. So I wrote anger on the bottom and I scribbled this drawing and it, I was mad at my dad. I was angry at my dad, but all the artwork had to do with my mom and it was stuff from my childhood. It wasn't anything to do with now, it, it was wild. And so I write the word anger and I, I was, just wrote the next word that came up and I scribbled a picture and I'd look at the picture and I'd feel it. And as I did this, um, I thought, well, I, this should be over. <laughs> so I wrote like a word that like would acceptance, right? To finish this up. And it was like some angry picture again. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I guess I'm not done. And at that point I let go and I just let it happen. So I did this, it might have taken 20 minutes, maybe, maybe, maybe 15, maybe 20. And when I was done, I felt done. And I was like, whoa. Within hours after completing that art therapy, I remembered I could paint. That was huge. I felt it in every cell of my body. I was hungry to paint. I was like, I was more than hungry. I was, it was as though I was craving it so bad that I could eat it. I could taste it. It was like, it was almost like, it was like being massively horny. You know, it was this amazing, overwhelming sense of, I have to have this and I have to take it into my body. And I didn't, I never felt anything this hungry before it. I've never been that 
like desiring of something and um oh it's crazy and I I just like started thinking okay so I have to paint I it wasn't even that I, it was like I have to paint I know how to paint I remember I can paint it was all these things that came out of this episode of anger from my dad it was really wild so I, I went on a hunt I went on a hunt and um I, I have a Jerry's catalog, you know, like, cause artists have that catalog and I'm looking through it and now I'm looking through it for paint. I never looked at it for paint before. And, uh, cause I was a glass artist. So I'm looking through it making lists of all the colors I want. I actually called a friend who was a painter. His name was Mike Bryce. And I asked him, what colors do you use? Cause I knew there was a ton of colors. His colors were the colors I used and loved in my glass work, but I didn't have names for them not in paint. So he's listing me the colors that he uses. And I'm like, yay, because then I'm not going to waste money buying paint that I wouldn't use or I wouldn't like. So those are the colors I start with. And I call family and friends all over the place. And I say, look, for a hundred bucks, <laughs> I will paint you a 20 by 20 or a 24 by 24 inch painting. Your choice, whatever genre you want. I didn't realize how crazy this was. Like now this sounds kind of crazy. You know, what if this, oh, I want a portrait of my dog or something. But Everyone was willing and it was amazing. And with $1,600, I purchased all my supplies. $1,600 I got from all these commissions to do. And um, I bought all the supplies and I just took off with the, with the painting. And it was intuitive. It most definitely was intuitive. It was just feeling it. And that's how I would describe when I first started teaching intuitive painting, I would say, it's not a thinking, it's a feeling. So you're feeling the waves. You're feeling the dog's fur. You know, you're feeling it. And the paintings that have come out of teaching with this idea are amazing. Like to see a nine-year-old girl paint a portrait of her dog and you feel like the dog's coming out of the painting. You know, it's just amazing. It gives me goosebumps. So this idea of, of being an intuitive artist, it's about tapping into your inner knowing to express that then to tap into the inner knowing for technique to tap into the inner knowing for the the knowing of the subject you know you're not just painting um what do you call it? Uh, like an ocean view you're experiencing it you're feeling it onto the canvas you know it's not just a still life you're feeling the petals you're feeling the the glass you're feeling the cool shadow and um, it doesn't matter then like, oh, do you know how to use color? No, you do know, like if you feel the passion to be an artist, then you know the color to use because you're tapping into a greater, the, the knowledge available going within is far greater than any knowledge of no matter how many teachers you access, no matter how many professionals you talk to, the knowing is huge. Like, you can know your way to genius through intuition. You will never know your way to genius through teach, through classes, through classes. It's, it's an inner gift. This idea of intuition, it's, it's available to everybody, not just artists. You know, it's available to a mother tapping into uh, knowing how to relate to her children or her husband. Um, it's in, intuition is just this amazing tool. I mean, you know, any genius worth their, <laughs> worth their whatever spark. And yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know the terms, but it's like any genius is going to tap into that because that's where all the goods are. So the idea that there's an end to it, there is no end. You know, you will. Through intuition, you get this idea. It's inspired action, like where to go next, what to try next. The people who are too, truly in their passion and attuned to this intuitiveness, they're um, having a successful business and then selling it off and starting a new one. Because the idea is that uh, it's to follow that bliss. So on top of that, we have what I call the creative abyss. And this is the place, this is huge. Like a creative abyss is that ability to know that there is going to be something there to catch you when you step into the nothing. Now, 
the nothing, it's like taking that leap of faith, but it's like the creative abyss. It's like, it's that moment that you have harnessed something new that's never been done and you walk into it, you step out into it, you create it. And the moment that you connect with that something that's never been is the moment that consciousness is expanded. And that is that harnessing of the, of the something from nothing. It's the harnessing, it's the new. And we never get to new when we keep doing the same old. And in this new, there's not any limit. It's like, it makes me think of the never ending story and how when they stopped believing, the world shrunk, you know, the darkness took it over. And that darkness is the, it's the, uh, it's the nothing of the creative abyss. So we can expand it as much as we can contract it and we contract it by forgetting our truth. Our truth is creators. And then as soon as we remember our truth, we expand it. We expand the world, the possibilities, the opportunities. We expand consciousness. Because when I try something new, when I explore, it makes it available for other people to do the same. Because they remember. They remember then who they are. So it's almost a responsibility to go explore. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's a responsibility to tap into your truth and your inner knowing and this uh, idea that you were, you came to create, you came to create. And creating, it's not just like I said about artistry, it's about creating space for relationship, creating relationship, creating a moment that has never been known before. And I myself know, like I fall into these old patterns of being a mommy based on my mommy, but then I was like, this isn't working. I'm not feeling the, the jeu de vivre, you know, the, the, the experience of like, living life at its highest potential with my daughter. And since I've taken and brought awareness to that, now I've accessed, like, how could I do this for the highest potential of both of us? Like, how can I do this moment with my daughter? And I fall into the old traps, but every moment I get a new moment <laughs> to try it new again. And the same thing with the artwork. You know, you can step into it and create and step out of it and take a breath and then in that breath, if we're asking the next question, the next question of how can I do this different or what, what would be, what would, what would make this more what I'm thinking? Those questions are the questions that bring in the answers, you know, that bring in the next idea. So I love expanding. I love expanding with my art. I love expanding with my daughter, with my friends. It's all, to me, it's all about that. And then I do so much enjoy my ebb time where I'm just quiet and enjoying nothing. But it's the expansion moments that balance that. You know, like, it's like, it's not, it's not the moments of um, busyness or doing that balance the ebb. It's the, it's the moments of expansion. And, and they, so you, ebb and flow. I ebb in my quiet, in my, in my nesting, and then I flow in the expansion, which is really fun. <laughs>